Wow, what a, what a difference a week makes, huh, sports fans? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I know Bob's coming in. I was just yeah. talking with him. He's, <laughs> he's coming in, and we got our, our group. So I like it. We're a little bit spread out. That's good for today because we've got a whole lot of soldiers that have uh, gone to the infirmary, right? Well, it's, let's, let's be honest, it's better to be safe than sorry, err on the side of caution with all this, right? Uh, that's where Amy's at. She's still struggling with some stuff, but she's okay. She just, she's actually feeling like maybe it's breaking today, maybe by tomorrow she'll be better. But she felt like she got run over by a truck Thursday, and she came home and crashed from 4 p.m. till, I think it was like 10 a.m. So she got, she's been sick. Dad and I bopped around all day yesterday. Well, <clears throat> as we get started, um, last week we ended with, uh, we finished chapter four of Amos. <clears throat> and this week, I'm hoping we can get through chapter five. And we'll see how that goes. Um, before we get started, it's because, you know, the, to me, the, the, the lion's share of the book, you know, is in the front chapters where, Amos comes in and pronounces judgment of all the nations around Israel, but then he, the bullseye is Israel. That's who the real message is for. And the message is God judges sin. And it's God's plea with pe the people. And as we read through it, a lot of it becomes repetitive. But, you know, I think that's just the mercy of God. God is merciful. And you make sure that, I guess the best way to put it, there's no one misunderstanding. And again, as I've said when we started the book of Amos, I, I, as I read it this time and having done it literally 10 years ago, um, different focus. And it really was the applicability of it. What is God talking about in here to them and how does it apply to us? Because our culture... If, if you read this, if you read Amos in the sins of the people, you got to look at our culture and say it doesn't look all that too different. And if the Bible is true and it says God changes not, then what does that say to a nation? And what are the warnings there? What are the warning signs? And what are the actions God calls us to? Okay? Let's go ahead and open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and that our ability to be here for those who are. But Lord, we remember those who are at home today because of the illnesses and sicknesses and the threats thereof. And we ask, Lord, that you would be with them and be with us. Be with us and open your, your, our eyes to your word. Help us to see the truth that you have for us and how we apply it in our lives, not only for ourselves, Lord, but to be a witness to the world. And we remember those who are home, many of them are battling illnesses, the flu, and some variation or another. And we pray you would comfort them, you would give them peace, you would give them healing, and bring them back uh, together that we may be able to have a, a bountiful worship with many people here. For it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. <clears throat> so, if you remember, chapter 4 was a rehearsal of how God had worked or moved previously for Israel as a warning. You remember he said, you had rain in this city, but not in that city. You had drought, you had famine, you had pestilence, you had mildew. Mildew came from flooding. You, you know, God says, I messed, with, I messed with the weather on you. <laughs> right? Because the promise was coming into the land was that God was going to give them a bountiful land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And he said, the way you'll know you're doing good between me and you is you'll have your rains and you'll have your crops and you'll plant and you'll harvest, which is really interesting because much of our, our left today expects to harvest without, a, without having to plant it. Somebody else is going to do the work. God didn't tell them that. God said, you're going to plant, you're going to work the fields, and you're going to harvest. And, and if that's going well, then understand that you're well with me. But if you start to deviate and leave me, I will start to come at you where? That's where he's going to first come at him. 
it was the most prevalent to them. They couldn't go down to Safeway or Winco and buy their food. Now, <clears throat> that was the warnings of the past. What they've, what basically, the warning signs they've missed. Chapter 5, he's going to start looking to the future of the coming punishment. But always with God, every time there's the announcement of coming punishment, what is there also the offer of? Salvation. Salvation with repentance, repentance right? In other words, why? Because why? you always got to think about it. Why is God going to judge? Is it capricious? Is it just because he decides to? No, why is it, Bob? Why is it God going to judge? He's going to judge us because three-letter word, sin. sin. <clears throat> Repentance is our way back. So this is his warning. Now in chapter 5, um, he, he's going to start to tell him it's coming. This is the inevitability of it. And don't play around with God and don't think you can keep getting away with it. Because the day you thought you got away with it is the day the, the trap snaps, right? I can do it one more time. <laughs> and it's a warning. Amos speaking, he says, Hear this word which I take up for you as a dirge, O house of Israel. She has fallen, she will not rise again, the virgin Israel. She's not, she lies neglected on her land, there is none to raise her up. For thus says the Lord God, the city which goes out, goes forth a thousand strong, will have a hundred left. And the one which goes out, for, goes forth a hundred strong, will have ten left in the house, to the house of Israel. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me that you may live. Okay? God, Amos is calling on the people to listen to God. Uh, and he's, he's going to identify some of the sins they're guilty of and underscores their need for repentance. Now, four times in chapter 5, God will exhort the people to turn from their wicked ways and to seek him, that he may not destroy them. Okay? as he did with Nineveh. Remember what was Jonah's message? Anybody remember? Repent. Forty days comes destruction. And the pagans did what? Repented. And what did God do? He stayed their destruction. About 75 years. Which I, I think biblically is like about two generations. In other words, those who repented and their children, but the next one was like too far. They had, well, again, <clears throat> they'd had their chance. Jonah came and they repented. Um, now, God talks to Israel, speaks to them here as a virgin. He had espoused them to him. And we're talking about this is the, the idolatry is considered harlotry, okay? Adultery. And they were still pure in the sense that they hadn't been taken captive. They're, they're still this fleeting opportunity for them if they seize it. This is their opportunity to seize the salvation. You know, today is the day of salvation and never, we're never to lose that and we're never not to let others know that. Given the opportunity to share with someone, it's nice to share with them, but always impress upon them that today is the day. You may not like me, you may not like what I heard, but you've heard the gospel. Every Sunday when Wally preaches, okay? So anybody sitting here who's not a believer, that is their day. That is their opportunity. They know for certain because they've heard the gospel that day. They may not have another day. They may not hear the gospel. They, their heart may not be receptive another day, but if they hear it, that's the day. And that's one of the things we have to impress upon people. When they hear it, and if you've shared it with them, make sure they get that this may be their opportunity. And don't, don't shun it, because you don't know if another one will come. <clears throat> now, what about the punishment? Look at the severity. 90% of 1,000, 100. Of 100, 10. That's near genocide. That's, that's how complete this destruction is. This is how complete the destruction is. God says it's going to be carnage. Why? Well, the people are sinning so greatly. Oh, it's another phone. It's over there. So, 
here's what we here's what, here's some things to think about when it comes to God and judgment. You remember what Abraham said to God as they approached Sodom and Gomorrah, and God was telling Abraham, "I'm going to destroy the city." Do you, do you remember? Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Oh, is that your? Oh. Anyhow, what, do you remember what Abraham, the question that Abraham asked? Will, will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? Right. And, and, but there should be left. Yeah. And, and the implication is, is the God of all the earth going to do right? And that's rhetorical because the answer is yes. yes. So when you hear that God says, out of a thousand... Only 100 will stay, and out of 100, only 10 will stay. What you know is of those who are going to be destroyed, there are none there who are righteous being destroyed. Right? Matter of fact, in one point, when, remember, uh, Elijah, he gets off in the cave and he's crying. He's licking his wounds. You know, he's, he's had Mount Carmel. And he's down there, and he's down there because Jezebel said, I'm going to kill you. And he says, God, I'm the only one. And he underscored only one left. You remember what God said to him? I got 7,000 who have not bowed the knees. And, 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 the, and then later on it says, God sent 7,000 to go fight a battle and they won. I, I believe that's who the 7,000 were. But, but the, the number is really small. Here's another thing. Jesus said, my sheep do what? They hear they, they hear my voice, and they follow me. They obey. I believe that as God sent these prophets into Israel, the ones who had a true heart for God, they looked around themselves, they saw what was going on, and they saw the guy, this is the real prophet of God, not these guys, and they hightailed it out. <clears throat> you ever been there? When you're probably younger, hopefully not, with other, other people, and you know they're going somewhere you ought not to go? And you did what? You, you went the other way. That was the conscious saying, hey, that was God speaking. I remember Dr. Stanley shared that when he was a young man, <clears throat> there was a group of boys doing something, going somewhere. He never told you, but he said, I knew I shouldn't. And so he turned around and they ridiculed him as he went away. And he said, God spoke to him in that moment and said, for your faithfulness, I'm going to bless you. And he contended that was his life. Because he was at a crossroads there that he made a wise choice that wasn't popular. That's a hard problem we have in our culture. Um, so 90%, only the faithful survived. And who were they? They were, well, the fact is they were predominantly the poor and the oppressed at this point. That's how far the society had gone. You know, we looked at Boaz recently. Remember, he was a successful guy down in Judah, right? And he was the great, he was a grand, he uh, he was a great grandfather of David, okay, and he was a, a wealthy guy, but he was a godly man. Well, by this point, well after David, all right, a couple hundred years, it seems like from the writings of the prophets that the rich had totally abandoned God. Anybody who was faithful was generally going to was poor, and they were oppressed. More than likely, the ones that God spared. Because it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of righteous, um, successful people. Because they were caught up, and we're going to see what they were caught up in. But he emphasizes the message. Okay, he, if you catch what he said in those verses, the message is of the Lord. It's not, this isn't what Amos thinks. This isn't what Amos is predicting. Um, this, this here is what God has said. Now, in verses 5 through 9... So he's saying it's it's the land is 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 ripe for it's a virgin, but it's going to go into captivity, right? And and there's going to be very small survival rate. Ten percent is the number. Um, and if you check verse four, thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, seek me that you may live. That's what he says. Seek me that you may live. Verse five, but okay, so that's why I put it. Seek me that you may live. Do not resort to Bethel. Do not come to Gilgal, nor cross over to Bathsheba. 
For Gilgal will certainly go into captivity. Bethel will come into trouble. Seek the Lord that he, you may live. He, so he brackets, don't go to those pagan places. Stay here. Or he will break out like a fire, O house of Joseph. It will consume with none to quench it for Bethel. For those who turn justice into wormwood and cast righteousness down to the earth. He who made the Pleiades in Orion and changes deep darkness into morning and also darkens day into night who calls for the waters of the seas to pour them out on the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name. It is he who flashes forth with destruction upon the strong, so the destruction comes upon the fortress. God's judgment is coming, and there's going to be no one to escape. There'll be no way to escape, <clears throat> but by returning to God, which is really an interesting thing. The only way to escape God's judgment is to run to God is to repent is to stop the way you're going and go backwards okay and it's not by making your own cleverly designed plans we've seen this before you know the idea of uh, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna find a way out we have an exit strategy God says there is no exit strategy against me he'll, he'll get to that one right um, because when God announces, announces announces his judgment his judgment is defined, and he is that um, <coughs> omnipotent and omniscient to be able to do it. Um, if you catch it, he's the creator of heaven and earth. See, he says, here's what you guys do. You turn justice into injustice. You turn it into wormwood. You, you throw righteousness to the ground. One translation is you've buried righteousness. You've killed righteousness. There's no righteousness left in the land. That's what you do. God says, I created the heavens and the earth. And he says, I'm the one that picks the water up and brings it. So what, what does that make you think? What is that where he picks the water up, makes it come across and drop it? Rain. rain. Think about God and judgment and rain anywhere in the Bible. Okay. He's painting a picture for it. God's saying, I judge sin. And these people are well aware of Noah. And you know this, that every time they go out and they find a uh, society and they dig up their history and they look at them, they all have some variation of a flood story. Did you know that? The only ones that don't have it are the ones today have become super caught up in their own abilities or that what they perceive as their abilities and say it didn't happen. All the evidence is clear that it did happen. So when he says, I'm the one that made the the Pleiades and the Ryans, right? The, the planets, the stars, the creation. If I did that, who are you to escape my judgment? And oh, by the way, I'm the one that causes the rain, the water to come up and to go where I send it. Why? Because in chapter 4, he told you, I put rain in this city and not in that city. I had a drought here and a, not a drought there, but over here they had a flood. Who did that? That was God Almighty. Okay. That's where he comes back to. He's, he's the one who does this. You guys, you guys can create, you guys can destroy righteousness. Okay? That's what he says. You, this is what you get to do. You, create, you make justice like wormwood. You, you pervert it. You kill righteousness. I'm the one that's going to come in judgment. He's the omnipotent, omniscient, <clears throat> omnipresent God. That's the picture. That's... If you're sinning and you think you're getting away with it, and if you think that you'll figure out how to get out of it, your exit strategy will fail. You'll not be able to outrun God. He will chase you down and he will get you. <clears throat> That's what he's telling the people. He's the one that takes darkness in the light. So if you think about it, the, the idea that he can take calamity and make prosperity. Judgment's coming. It's going to be terrible. But if you repent, I can turn that calamity around and send it away. I can take prosperity and turn it into calamity. It says I can take day and make it night. Now, he's not talking about the, the solar eclipse, right? But it is a picture that he controls the planets. But the idea, right, the rich think they've got it all made. And they're living high on the hog, as it were, right? 
They think they've got it all set. And God says, I can take that prosperity and I, in, a, in a moment. Remember Job's story? How long did it take Job to lose everything? One day. And God allowed, permitted everything that Job had to be gone. Every night, well, I'm going to quote a former Sunday school teacher. We had Steve Cannon. Everybody's wanting to know about the second coming of Christ. If you read, we don't do it much today. If you read your obituaries in today's paper, their second coming came yesterday. Yeah. See, when he says, see the guy, the rich man, who's got it all, who's living without any regard for God because he's got all that he needs and more, and he's living at ease and he's in comfort. And God says to the fool, what does it say? Yeah, he exactly says, Thou fool, tonight, this very night, your soul is required of you. Right? That's the picture. See, God says you're going to live like there's no tomorrow. You think you've got it all figured out. You who destroy justice and kill righteousness, understand what I can do. I can take that which you trust in and destroy it. And really, if you do some checking, if you go back and read some of the historical books, um, well, at one point, and this is kind of Judah, not Israel, but Hezekiah does what? Well, he shows Babylonians all the riches of Judah. And the prophet came and said, boy, big mistake, Isaiah says, because what? They're going to come in and take it all because you showed it to them. And they made an alliance, Israel, the northern tribes, who were being judged. They kept relying on these guys. If you check, they would sin and get in trouble, and they would call on one another to go fight one another. And eventually, they, they became the ones who cleared the... They knew them. They built their own um, trap, as it were, which is kind of an interesting thing, because the Bible talks about that, where you build the trap and you fall into it. And what happened was they took on the characteristics of the enemy and became like their enemy, and then the enemy destroyed them. And as I tell you that, I'm thinking like, wow, look at our culture... Look at our society. I really want to look at the church, you know, nationally and globally. How much the church takes on the form of the enemy being the world. And we become the world. And then who's going to destroy the church but the world? Right? We have to be different. We don't have to be oddballs. But we do have to be different. And if we're different in a godly way, the world may not, the world will not accept you. They will not love you. Lose that thought, okay? Living for righteousness and standing up for holiness, the world's not going to embrace you. But if that's who you are and that's what you live for, at least one thing you can know that they'll respect it. They may still despise you and hate you and want to kill you. But at least you've done God's service. Verse uh, 10 through 15. So They hate him who, re who reproves in the gate, and they whore him who speaks with integrity. Therefore, because you impose heavy rent on the poor and extract a tribute of grain from them, though you have built homes, houses of well-hewn stone, yet you will not live in them. You have planted vi pleasant vineyards. You will not drink their wine. For I know your transgressions are many, your sins are great. You who distress the righteous and accept bribes and turn aside the poor in the gate. Therefore, at such a time, the prudent person keeps silent, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. Thus may the Lord God of hosts be with you, just as you have said. Hate evil and love good. Establish justice in the gates. Perhaps the Lord God of hosts may be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Got that in there? Hate evil, love good. Three times. Okay, he again re reveals more of their sins of the people. They pervert justice to obtain um, their goals and objectives, right? And we have it today. The ends justify the means. Whatever it takes. I've heard this. Uh, if, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. I, I mean, I hear this, and you know, it's kind of tongue-in-cheek, but I think at, at the core, for a lot of people, that's really how they look at the world. Okay? And I, all right, I... I think there's a big um, picture of our society, our culture, like in uh, like public events, like sports. And you see where you find people, teams are cheating 
because winning is the objective regardless of how you get there. Sportsmanship is out the door, right? And then you have it where it gets found out, and then because of commercialism, and we don't want to disrupt the apple cart and admit we have a problem, they bury it and they ignore it, and they just act like it didn't happen. And, you know, they just go on their merry way. Well, that's our society. He talks about people perverting justice. Uh, they have a situational ethics. What is situational ethics? Anybody know? When we say that, we kind of banner. What is situational ethics? Flexible. The answer changes depending on your circumstances. Flexible. The, the circumstances. Is it circumstances or is it what it means to you? <laughs> right? Well, some of us even change it from place to place, it's geography. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, situational ethics is our culture that says there really are no ethics. The ethics you play are what, what is playing right now. For example, if you're a salesman and you're dealing with somebody who's a righteous person, you're going to talk very holy and righteous, but it's not who you are. You'll still be a lying, conniving thief, cheat, but you make it sound like you're there. And so that, that's just our culture. That's not who we're to be, okay? Jesus said, let your yes be yes, your no be no. But their problem was that's exactly, they, their scales were unbalanced. They cheated. They lied. Why? The ends justified the means. What were the ends? I win, okay? If you caught the sin there, you, you impose Heavy, <coughs> excuse me, heavy rent on the poor. You know, I can't think of, but like today, like, so I don't know if you're from a business world, you hear it out in the culture. They don't raise, people, entities don't necessarily raise their prices because there's a force that causes it, you know, raising, rising costs. A lot of times it's just because they want more. A lot of companies aren't happy if they made X percent margin last year, well, for this year to be good, we'll have to make X plus beyond inflation. And salesmen get run up against this. You have to, you know, the, the, the economy grows by 3%. We want you to grow margins by 10. Well, there's a problem with that. You're only going to get it by taking it from somebody. And again, rent is pretty obvious. <laughs> Try to rent a place today. It's not necessarily supply and demand. Sometimes it's just we want more. Um, they would, they would uh, also bend the law if not break the law. Why? Well, he said there's no, they don't want to hear the guy in the gate. That's where the judges sit. They didn't want righteous judges. What do they want? They wanted, their way. They wanted the judges that would let them do what they wanted to do. How'd they get that? Bribery. <coughs> Bribery. Now, you can call it all you want. You can call it political action committees. You can call it speaking fees. Uh, but bribery is bribery. And they perverted justice. How is justice perverted? Well, the law says that you can do this and you can't do that. And we get a judge that says, well, in this case, situational, we can let it be this. because, And they extrapolate it out to some degree. That, the judgment is just so we look at our culture and say, are we any different? We are, they, they broke the law, they excuse it away, at the expense of whom? Not themselves, right? But at the poor and the needy. The ones that needed the justice and the help, the ones who God said, I've set up civil government to protect, were the ones that were being abused by that power. Um, here's the thing, God is condemning greediness. Does anybody know what Paul said about greediness? Idolatry. It's idolatry. I don't care what you think about yourself or anybody. If anybody who is a greedy person, Paul says you're an idolater. What are you idolatrizing? Money. Money. You may not pour the gold over a little piece of wood or stone, but you're still pouring the gold over something. God condemns greediness, which is idolatry. He also condemns taking advantage of the poor or the weak. Read your book. You'll find it. He talks about it in terms of 
widows and orphans, the most helpless of helpless in that time, okay? And he says, you did this to them. And what did Jesus say? If you did it to the least of them, you did it to me. Why? It's a warning, you know? You hear in culture, and again, because they didn't want to hear truth, the, the society, because it was doing, they were doing it up here, everybody wanted their piece of the pie, and it was proliferating through the whole society. And we're supposed to be salt and light. We're to kind of refute that or keep it back. And so when you hear it, you know, we don't want to just go, oh, yeah, that's what it is. We need to kind of like say, hey, wait a minute. The poor and the needy need somebody to stand up for them. Needs to sit there and say, wait a minute. Isn't that just greediness that you're doing this? Challenge people. Um, God says here that all that the wicked had acquired illegitimately, all they have obtained and built up, God says you're going to lose it because I'm going to take it from you. Think about that. God's the one who's going to make sure it gets wiped out. Remember, how did they come in the land? Do you remember when Israel, the nation Israel, all 12, came into the land? God says, you're going to live in cities you didn't build, you're going to live in homes you didn't build, and you're going to eat from vineyards you didn't plant. And God, guess what? He says the same thing to them. You're going to, you're going to be the ones being dis disposed, sent out, and the same thing that you did, these people will do. They're going to eat your, your fruits, they're going to live in your cities. They're going to live in your homes. What, what, what does that say? Well, what, what's the value in building it up? What was the value in pursuing it? What was the value in it taking advantage of the needy if you don't have it? See, now you're going to pay a bill that you got not for something you didn't get anything out, right? You have the bill of your sin that you're going to pay for, and all that you thought you were going to acquire by your sin, you've lost. Right, but we have that today. The ro guy robs a bank in America. Ninety-nine point nine percent of the time, he's going to jail, and he don't get. He they get all they get like ninety-nine percent of the money back. All he does is give up nineteen years of his life <clears throat> for what? Nothing. Nothing. Um, justice and integrity were perverted. It was a part of the system. It was a way of life. And then <clears throat> you couldn't withstand. Or stand up against the wickedness. <clears throat> um, why? Well, it's ingrained to everybody. Nobody would listen to it. And nobody wanted to call righteous. It says, the prudent person keeps silent. It's an evil time. And it's, I think that's kind of where our society is at, at today. The, the system, the cultural system, is so warped and perverted away from God that if you stood up for God and you make your profession for God, you're going to get shot, shouted down. Mm -hmm. But here we have Amos at the same time standing boldly for God. And isn't it interesting? We have what he said. The prudent man says, you know what? Now's not the time because nobody's listening. What is that? That, that to me is that idea of, I think where a lot of Christians are like, well, what does it matter? And Amos is a, is a glaring example against that. It does matter. Somebody needs to stand up. Isaiah, who, who will go? Who will stand in the gap? Send me. I'll do it. Where can you do that? Can you do that? Can you do that in your life today? Can you be the one that can stand in the gap for God? Yeah, every one of us can be. At that point in that place. You may not be called like Amos to go in and bust in on the White House. Try that one. <laughs> and stand up and point your finger at him and, and pronounce the judgments of God. But actually we can be far more effective just like the early church was. Because they had a culture that was just as broken as ours. Just as broken as Israel's is, right? You remember this when the guy asked Paul when Paul was getting beaten in the centurion? He says, are you going to beat a Roman citizen without a trial? And the centurion stopped him. And he said, are you a Roman citizen? And Paul said, yeah, I was born. I'm born a Roman citizen, dude. I got the A card. And remember what the centurion said about his citizenship? I had to pay for it. I had to buy with a lot of money. See, Rome 
was no different than Israel is here or we are now. How did they change the Roman culture? How did they break the stranglehold of evil? What was it that changed the world? Christianity. Christianity. How did Christianity change the world? Well, just like the 14 of us sitting here, one person at a time, but that one person that got changed took that message and shared it with who? Another person. Another person, other persons they were in contact. See, it moves real slowly, but God says, I work. I work through what? Through my word, through my church. That's why we're called salt and light. If we, if we hide in a corner and say the world is, is, is broken and it's, it's just descending into this never-ending pit, then we're not going to make an impact in our culture. The understanding that we're not going to turn the world into a Christian world. God said, read the book, it's not going to happen. But we're the saver of salt on the world. We're the preserving agent that keeps from going amok faster, Right? And at the end, God didn't tell you to change the world. He said, I'm going to change you, and you're to take the message, and we'll change, I will change others. Okay? In verses 16 through 20, <clears throat> Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, the Lord, there is wailing in the, all the plazas and all the streets. They say, alas, alas. They also call the, <clears throat> they also call the farmer to mourning, and professional mourners to lamentations. In all the vineyards there is wailing, because I will pass through the midst of you, says the Lord. Alas, you who are longing for the day of the Lord, for what purpose will the day of the Lord be to you? It will be darkness and not light. For when a man flees from a lion and a bear meets him, or goes home and leans his hand against the wall and a snake bites him, will not the day of the Lord be darkness instead of light, even gloom, with no brightness at all? God's warning, his judgment is coming, and when God's judgment comes, no one escapes. No matter where you go, you try to. All will lament and suffer. And again, remember, part of the blessings or the cursings of the Mosaic system was, if you come into the land and you do what I tell you, you'll have your rains. The rains produce your crops. They're an agrarian culture. Their success depended upon those rains. Well, they're going to call the farmer to lament. Why? He has no crops. The vineyard, they're going to lament and cry. Why? There's no, no crops. First warning sign, God says. When you went, remember David? If you remember the story of David, he's sitting around and he's, you know, he's living for God and all of a sudden he looks up and he goes, I think it was a three-year drought. And he goes to the Lord and says, what's going on? He goes, oh. Saul killed the Gibeonites who you had a treaty with. You have to square that away. David picked it up. He goes, hey, we're, we're in a drought. There's something going on. And he went and inquired of the Lord. And the Lord told him, you got, a, you got sin in the camp and you haven't dealt with it. Saul had sinned and the nation hadn't rectified it. You hadn't gone back to the Gibeonites and settled, settled it up. Um, Here's the thing, you know, he says, if you notice here, um, wh who, who are you that want the longing of the day of the Lord? The day of the Lord is a day of judgment. It's darkness. And I think we get that kind of in our own culture. You know, like we have in the church where people look at the world and, oh, it's so bad. God's got to come in judgment. And God says, whoa, whoa, do you realize what God's judgment is? You know? God says judgment is his strange work. What's his preferred work? Salvation. Yeah. His preferred work is to save people. Judgment is his strange work. It's not his preferred work. God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Amen? And he's saying, so if you're going to sit around and look at the world and it's all falling apart, and you have this idea of God needs to come in judgment, and I don't know, I mean, maybe I'm reading into this, but it's, it, it, I think he's talking to some you're really uh, ungodly, self-righteous people. Maybe put it that way. 
In other words, they're, they're kind of really full of themselves, and they think they're all that in a bag of chips, too. And they're thinking they're better than other people. Now, God is not condoning sin. He's condemning the sin here, right? But do you really want God to judge those who you see as sinning, or would you rather see God move in mercy and have them become saved and have them change their ways? And I think there's a lot of Christians that would rather have God judge those with whom they disagree with, morally, uh, politically, uh, any, in a lot of other areas, then, then to seem to be, come to salvation. Kind of like the Jonah syndrome, right? Why did he not want to go to Nineveh? Anybody remember? He knew that God would change his mind and then repented. Because God was going to change his mind or change his actions when they repented, which would mean what? Yeah, he had a prejudice. He didn't want them to get saved. Okay? And we just have to make sure in our own... I just want us to always check in our own heart we're not in the same boat. There are a lot of things going on in the world that I totally disagree with. Politically, socially, commercially, there's a whole lot. But I can't be in that position of God bring the judgment day on him. Because what does it mean? They're, well, they're going to go to hell. And I can't have anybody, or for any reason, race, creed, color, religion, moral bend, whatever, and sit there and say, well, they, 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 um, I want them in hell. What I want is for God to change because that's to God's glory. Because when the person who is that person that I despised comes to Christ, uh-oh, who are they now? Even if it's like Shelby and Thomas? <laughs> who are they now? Well, they're brother or sister in Christ. And I think sometimes we get scared by that. Christianity is replete with this. We've got a whole lot of little boxes we check that we pass and that they don't. And we say, well, well God just needs to just deal with that. Okay? And is that really what we're after? You really? Okay, so pick out some things in our, our culture. Abortion. Abortion providers. Folks, you realize that as mad as that, ang as much as that may anger us, do you realize that the abortion provider, he does not realize, she does not realize, or she is, they have blocked it from their mind that they will answer to God for that? And Hebrew says it's a frightful thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. And the prayers really should be God open their eyes. Who better to stop abortion than the abortion provider who finds out that it's horrendous offense to God? Having never been there, right? You and I, not being abortion providers, really don't have a voice in that battle. They're not going to listen to us, but it's one who did, who can turn, might. Somebody who's in the, in the homosexual community living a life of sin and immorality, when God turns that person, understanding that if they don't turn, where they end up in? And they'll end up in hell, being judged for sin, which God condemns. Right? And, and I think there's a picture here when it says, look out for you who want the day of the Lord. What is the purpose of the day of the Lord to you? Why do you want to see God move in judgment? I really would encourage us all to pray to God and move in mercy. I think if you want to look at our nation to be saved, I'd rather have it come through the mercy side. Because, by the way, if you read the stories of Judah and Israel, when God moved in judgment, when he sifted the wheat, right? Everybody paid. Where did Daniel end up? In Babylon. What was he in Babylon? Vice president. Well, that's where he ended up, but... There's a real important thing that happened to Daniel when he went to Babylon as a man. He went to Babylon as a eunuch. Yes. Daniel. Yeah. God said your men will be eunuchs in the court of the kings. Why? Well, that's what God said. They were they Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
They ended up in the court, but it really wasn't without a cost. And the other thing was they're 800 miles from home. God says when he judges Israel, those who are meant for captivity will go to captivity. Those of the sword will die of the sword. Those of pestilence will die of the pestilence. He goes, there are those who will be eaten by bears and lions, and there will be those eaten by uh, birds. Judgment's not a pleasant thing. It's a picture. Never pray for that. Pray that God's mercy, he moves in mercy. Our nation needs that. We need an outbreak of the Holy Spirit to move in lives because men are blinded by their sin. Remember when Wally looked at the parables of the sower and the seed, that first one, the seed is put out and who steals it? The birds. Well, the birds in the picture is Satan, Satan takes it. That's your enemy. That's who your enemy is. <coughs> um, when judgment comes, here's the other thing he tells them. It's going to come quickly and unexpectedly. They're not going to see it. It's unanticipated. Think about the flood with Noah. How much, how much warning did they have? Anybody know? Ballpark? Over 100 years. Now, everybody knows. Over 100 years. Uh, 125, 150, 175, we can debate that. It was over 100 years. And yet, when it came, what is it? They didn't know. They it didn't it didn't hit until what? Until the, the rains came, which was seven days after God closed the door. Remember that they got on the ark. God closed the door. God gave them seven days for somebody to come up, knock on the door, and said, "Hey, can I get in?" Nobody did. And when it came, well, what would happen? It was too late, right? And I think, I think you know, think about that. That's one of the anguishes, right? As these people are getting flooded out and drowned, there, there's this, this song or this sound resonating in their mind. And what is it? It's Noah. Because remember, these people weren't living 50 and 60 years. They were living a long, long time. So they had all heard the 125 years. Anybody more over 125 years had heard it? Yeah, Bob. Oh, yeah, and, and that's it. And I, and I think here, because we'll get to this with Amos, and it's the same with Judah, that when, when the enemy finally does come and finally does break through, that, boom, triggers it. And here's the scariest part. God talks about they're going to call on me, and I'm not going to hear them. Yeah. He tells Isaiah, he tells Jeremiah, the same thing. They're going to call for me, and I am not going to answer them. Because as it were, the, the stroke of the pen has happened. God has signed the decree. When God has made that decision, he's made that decision. And his decision is always right. And he knows that their repentance is temporal. In other words, once I'm saved from the circumstances I'm in, I'm not there. So I'm not going to hear you. Judgment is coming. And that's what happens. They, get, they literally get destroyed. And now we call them what? You know what they're called now? They're called the lost ten tribes. They're not lost to God. God knows where they're at. If you read your historical books, you'll see that there were people from the northern ten tribes that did go back did go south into Judah um, and avoid the, the captivity for another 170 years or thereabouts, 150 years thereabouts, before Judah fell. Okay, and Even when they came back, there were uh, records in, a, in the accounts that there's some people in there that you can find are scattered among the tribes. But at the end, God doesn't need our record keeping, does he? No. He has his own set of books, does he not? And what is the question that every man or woman must answer? Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Is your name in the Lamb's Book of Life? Here's an interesting thing for you to do your own Bible study on about the Lamb's Book of Life, the life. Look through the Bible for the, 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 the reference where God talks about, think about this, says where he blots the name out. See, I think that's significant. Talks about that, that God, you know, don't blot my name out. He blots names out. What does it mean to blot a name out? What's the important? What's that? 
Okay, so race, but what does it mean before a race? You were in there. You were in there. God is not willing that any should perish. And I believe he, that is his honest truth. But why is our name blotted out? Well, Paul says in Corinthians, he says, because, because the, the gospel is hidden until what? The heart turns to God. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not into the Calvinist-Armenian fight. I'm going to tell you this. God says it's whosoever, and uh, whosoever is whosoever. It's you. Come unto me, all ye who are heavy laden, or all you who are heavy laden. That's an open invitation. <clears throat> so whether you want to debate, I'm not going to get into the ethereal debate, was it God or me. God says if you want to come, guess what? Come. You can come. Good Don't blame God. And if one chooses not to come... I kind of go look, blot it out and see it throughout the, the scriptures where it talks about blotting out names. That means the name was there and it had to be blotted out. You know? And then he says, why do you want to judge? Uh, the people who try to escape, they're going to go from one threat to another unexpected threat. You know, the picture of the, you know, you, you run from the bear, you encounter a lion. You escape the lion, you get home. And you put your hand against the wall and you didn't even see it coming and the viper hit you. Right? Uh, that's the scary part. Why that's a warning is, <laughs> I think there's another warning there. I, I, I apply to myself is always remember that no matter how cunning you think you may, are, you may be <laughs> at devising sin or sinful plans, it don't always work out. God is able to, in circumstances, you know, yeah, it just, it's, just, it's just a warning. Anyhow, that will take us through Amos 5 today. Um, we'll pick up with uh, 6 next week. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to dutifully get through a chapter a week so we don't draw this out forever. Because the, we're going to start getting into some of the same. God is just going to start repeating and repeating himself as a warning to people. But as we go ahead and close, and by the way, just so you know, uh, we're not doing the refreshments today, we're trying to keep everybody a little bit safer distance and stuff. So just something to remember. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Remember those who are sick and not here. Lord, we thank you for your word. And we ask as we go out that we might be that salt and light in a dark world, that we may not despise righteousness and holiness. We may, uh, instead of keeping quiet about righteousness and holiness, we may speak forth boldly like Amos and, Lord, uh, not to look for the day of your judgment, Lord, but for your mercy and grace, not only on, on us, but individuals that we know and people that we encounter or we see in this world. Many who are in high political office have a lot of power, Lord, who are leading openly ungodly lives. And we just pray, Lord, that you would work in your way to change their hearts. Um, let them to know, God, that they answer to you for how they administer their offices. Lord, we just pray for our sick brothers and sisters in Christ and ask that you would raise them up and bring them back together with us. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.